Morning, everyone. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. If you missed Jeff's introduction uh, a few minutes ago, and you're wondering who is this guy up here who is not your pastor, uh, my name is Chester Reineman. I'm the pastor of one of your sister congregations in Calgary, Alberta. And uh, it, I'm going to say it again, it's really a privilege and an honor to be here sharing um, the Word of God with you today and, and also worshiping God with you. Thank you for having me here. It's uh, yeah, really good to be here with you. I know Jeff a little bit. I'm sorry, you, maybe you know him as Pastor Jeff, Pastor Courtright. We actually meet every week online for a little Bible study. We, uh, we study the sermon scripture that's coming up later in the week. We study it together and we kind of bounce ideas off each other to, to figure out how we're going to share this message, how we're going to preach this, this scripture. So Jeff and I have actually been doing the same sermon series this Easter season, a Resurrection Reality. We've been talking about how, how wonderful this, this reality of Jesus coming back from the dead is and what an impact that makes on our lives. The scripture that you heard just a few moments ago uh, from 1 John in chapter 3, it talks about the Christian life and the impact of the resurrection that it has on our lives. It tells us that we bear fruit. And some pretty incredible fruit. I don't know if you if you turn back to that page in your in your little service folders to first John chapter three. If you remember when when Pastor Jeff was reading that section, doesn't it seem that what the Apostle John is talking about is a little bit like, like a superhero Christian. Do you remember what John was talking about? That this new life and the fruit that we have in Jesus, it is so incredible. It means that we have confidence with God. It means we have peace. It means we have our hearts set at rest. I don't know about you, but my heart gets heavy and troubled so often. He really need this. So it, he talks about how our hearts are set at rest with Jesus. He talks about how our prayers are powerful. And then when we pray because of Jesus, we receive everything we ask for. He talks about how the life we have in Christ is full of obedience, lives that are pleasing to God. This is the fruit, the fruit of faith in Jesus. I don't know about you, though, but uh, when I hear that, it, I, I, I kind of I think of it as like John is talking about a superhero Christian. Like when I think about my life, it doesn't always look like what John is saying here. It's hard to see or even imagine my life ever being exactly like what John is describing. Is that type of life possible? Where your heart is at rest and your prayers are powerful? And you're living a life that is pleasing to God. I believe it is possible. Jesus tells us it is possible today. And I want to share with you how. And especially how to get that a one thing that John focuses on in this section, which is hearts at rest. If we begin uh, reading from that section of 1 John chapter 3, if we begin at verse 18, John tells us, he encourages us to live up to our calling, which is to love. John says, dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. John says that God calls us to a life of genuine love. We are to love God with everything we are. We are to love others as God has loved us. This is our primary purpose in life. He wants genuine love. He says, let's not just talk about it. I think almost everyone in this city, almost everyone in the world can agree that love is a good thing. But John says, can we not just talk about it and agree that it's a good thing? Can we actually love and love as God has loved us? 
problem comes in when we don't do that. John says when we don't do that, our hearts condemn us. This is what he says next. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. When John says, this is how we know we belong to the truth, he's talking about how as believers in God, we want nothing to do with hypocrisy. We want to we wanna say what we mean, and we want to do what we say. We want to follow Jesus, and we want to genuinely love others as we have been loved. But what happens is, as we grow in our faith in Jesus and as we learn what his will is for our lives and just how much he's asking us to love people, what happens is our hearts are often not satisfied with the progress that we've made. And our own hearts will accuse us of a lack of love and a lack of obedience. Our own hearts will condemn us. Before we get into how to set our hearts at rest, you should know this. You're not alone in struggling with this. With a heart that is troubling you, you're not alone in that. Even the Apostle John struggled with a heart that sometimes condemned him. And you remember who the Apostle John was? John was Jesus' best friend. When God came to earth in Jesus, like all of us, he had his, he had friends. John was his closest friend. When you read about John in scripture, he is described as the one Jesus loved. Even John, Jesus' best friend, struggled with a heart that condemned him at times. So what that means is you're not alone when you're up late at night, lying in your bed with your thoughts troubling you. You're not alone with your conscience attacking you for not doing that good thing you, sh you know you should have done. You're not alone in that. The Apostle John struggled with that. I struggle with that. Every Christian, every child of God struggles with that at times. What we find is our motives are mixed. You know, we'll, we'll try to live up to this calling to love others as God has loved us. But then we'll, when we'll do that, we'll, we'll do a good thing. But then we'll, we'll find that we did it because we had to. Or we did it to make ourselves look good in front of others. Our motives are mixed. We're not the loving, genuine people that we want to be. And our hearts notice. Our hearts condemn us. One of the ways that our enemy, the devil, one of the ways that Satan attacks us and tries to destroy us is through this condemnation of our hearts. Satan will speak to us. And we don't, we don't often realize he's doing it. But Satan will heap condemnation on us through our hearts. Satan loves to do this. Have you ever, have you ever heard these thoughts in your head? What is wrong with you? How could you do that? A, a believer in God wouldn't do that. That's your heart condemning you. That's Satan speaking through your heart to you, trying to drive you down. Trying to weigh down your heart with guilt. He wants you carrying that weight around. He wants you with a heavy heart because he knows it's hard to love hard to love your family. It's hard to love the people around you when your heart is heavy and it feels cold and condemned. 
how do we set our hearts at rest? John tells us, this is how we set our hearts at rest. In God's presence. That's the first thing he says. We set our hearts at rest in God's presence. We believe in the Son of God. We believe in Jesus, and we know because we believe in him, Jesus lives in us, and we in him. We are always in God's presence, always in Jesus' presence. And we know from another scripture, this one from the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. John adds in this letter, he says, God is greater than our hearts. And what he means by that is God is a greater and a more reliable judge than our hearts are. And you know what God says? God, the ultimate judge, has mercy. And he delivers a verdict as if from a courtroom that we are not guilty. It's like God bangs his gavel. Oh, heaven, how sturdy is this? It's like God bangs his gavel saying, you are not guilty. You are free to go. You're free to live. How is that possible? Our hearts are condemning us because we have sin. We are guilty. How is it that God could say we are not guilty? And declare that from the courtroom of heaven. This is how. Because Jesus, the son he has sent to us, has died for us and rose for us. The scriptures say, this is in Romans chapter 4, that Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Because Jesus died as a sacrifice for our sins, there is no punishment left for our sin. There's no condemnation left. And Jesus' resurrection from the dead proves it. You could say that the resurrection of Jesus verifies God's verdict that we are not guilty. We're not liable to be punished for sin. We are justified. That's the Bible's word for that, that we are justified. We are declared not guilty. It's a little bit like the verdict that came out of the O.J. Simpson trial. I don't know if you have heard of O.J. Simpson before. If, if you haven't, he's a famous American, or he was a famous American football player and an actor. You may have seen his name come up in the news recently because he passed away just uh, about three weeks ago. O.J. Simpson is not only famous for being a, a great football player, he's also infamous for murdering his wife. You go back, it's a, it's a, it's a troubling and tragic story they find his ex-wife dead along with one of her friends. They find DNA evidence tying O.J. Simpson, this famous football player, to the scene. And he goes on trial. What happened is the prosecution bungled the case against O.J. Simpson. And the verdict that ended up coming out of the trial was that he was not guilty. He, had, he got to walk free. This man was clearly guilty of murder. But the judge and the court declared him not guilty. And he got to walk. Our justification before God is a little bit like that. Maybe we haven't committed murder. We have committed other sins. 
God declares us not guilty. And we get to walk. We get to live with God. We have freedom. And a life full of fruit, full of blessings that Jesus just provides for us. You know, the reason that God declares us not guilty, it's not because Satan, our enemy, has bungled the case against us. It's that God's son, Jesus, took the punishment we deserved upon himself. He took our sins away. He, he took the condemnation that was coming toward us away. That's why God declares us not guilty. That's why we have a life and fruit with God. Next time your heart condemns you, when you feel that guilt, that heaviness on your heart, remember what Jesus did for you. And remember God's verdict, that you are not guilty. Only God's verdict matters. What John also says, he not only says God is greater than our hearts. He says that God knows everything. Now that's, that's interesting. Why, why does John say that God knows everything? And, and how is that supposed to set our hearts at rest? Well, if you take a look at the next word that John wrote. It says, God knows everything. Dear friends. That word translated here as dear friends is the, the Greek word agape toi, which literally means dear loved ones. John says, God knows everything. Yeah, he knows your faults. Yeah, he knows your failures. And he still loves you. He still loves you with an unconditional, unending love that we call grace. He knows that our failures are not because we don't believe in him and that we're hypocrites. He knows we're weak. And we have our moments of weakness. God knows that we are his people. And we belong to the truth. We are his dear children. And he loves so much. Dear friends, you who are loved by God, would you please remind yourselves of that? If there's something that you could take home from today, just, just one thing, it would be this. Would you please remind yourselves every day of how much God loves you and that God and his verdict that you are not guilty, that is greater than your hearts. It's greater than what your heart says. Listen to God. Remember his love for you. And trust me, your heart will begin to be more at rest. If you're anything like me, your heart can get troubled every day. This is why we need to do this every day. Please remind yourselves of this. Whether it's in your prayer time, your devotion time, you know the time that is best for you. This is what we desperately need. As we do that, I believe that we'll begin to experience a little bit more of what John says in the last section of these verses. John says, dear friends, you who are loved by God, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him everything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. John wants to take us to a place where we're not even listening to our hearts because God is greater. 
That's a life where there is no condemnation, only confidence for God. Where we're not beating ourselves up for all the mistakes that we've made. But we're remembering God has blessed us with his love and forgiveness in spite of our mistakes and for the sake of Jesus. When we do that, and as we do that more and more, we'll be so in tune with God that we'll receive everything we ask for in prayer. We will strive to please him in everything we do. This is where I was telling you before, where I feel like John is, is describing some sort of superhero Christian. He's not describing a superhero Christian. He's describing the Christian that you are. And you will grow into being. This kind of life can seem so unattainable. What God promises us here it isn't. It's not impossible. All things are possible with God. And we can do all through Christ, our Savior, who strengthens us. If you remember what Jesus told us today, and I'd like to close with this. Jesus told us in John 15, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Since we are in Jesus by faith, we will bear much fruit. Not we should bear much fruit or we might bear much fruit. We will. That's his promise. In Jesus, we will grow in faith and in love. We will set our hearts at rest in his presence. We will pray powerfully and effectively. We will have confidence with God. We will live lives that are pleasing to him. This is where we want to be and where we want to grow into more and more. Dear friends, we're loved by God. This, this is what will be guaranteed by the power of Jesus' resurrection. Amen.